You're listening to Sonic Hall Radio. That's right. Thank you very much for downloading the recent and the most recent episode of Hashtag Life Stories here on Solihull Radio. Today I am joined live in the studio by another wonderful person that's got in touch with us here at the station and said, hold on a second, Jeff, I'd like to be involved in that, if you would. Um, So a big, big welcome to Karen Bucknell. Karen, how are you? I'm really well. How are you, Jeff? Yeah, not too bad today. Thank you very much. Um, Karen, you come to us with an amazing life story. Uh, I've looked through some of your bios and uh, had a little bit of research and things. And we've just had a little chat off air, haven't we, about a shared interest. But we'll talk a little bit about that Ooh, later. We will. <laughs> so tell us, um, tell us a little bit about where you come from. And uh, you're, you're a local person. So let's begin the story. We started not that long ago, uh, <laughs> but in uh, Acox Greenway. We did, and um, it's nearly 50 years ago because next year it's the big five o. Right. Um, yeah, I was born and bred in um, Acox Green. Uh, I went to school in Acox Green, mm-hmm. and um, I'm very, very lucky that a lot of my school friends from like 1975... 1981 wow. um i'm still very very good friends with that's good so yeah and i'm very proud to be a brummy and i'm very proud to be a villa fan right we've we've got that out the way quite early <laughs> on haven't we so everyone's either turned off or continued <laughs> listening to our wonderful a wonderful interview here um <laughs> it, we are in conversation with you karen so where would you like to begin because you've got lots of avenues um, and lots of different stories to tell us about your particular life journey, haven't you? Um, you've had a bit of a setback, haven't you, in terms of your health? So as we were moving through, you, you know, tell us a little bit about w- when you suddenly noticed what was going on and you needed some help. Yeah, um Life is really good for me at the moment. Hmm. Um, I'm at university. I'm going into my third year at Coventry University studying sociology. Um, I've discovered this wonderful passion called media. Um, So, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Because it just happened. I don't know how. Um, Basically, it all started, I would say, New Year's Eve. Um, I was watching the fireworks on the telly, you know, sitting there like knobby no mates (laughs) welcoming in the new year because I don't particularly like New Year's Eve. So I just tend to watch it on the telly with a glass of pop. And then at about half past 12, I'm in bed and hearing all the fireworks outside. But I had this strange feeling um, as the BBC were doing their, you know, bong, Mm -hmm. bong. I thought something awful is going to happen. I couldn't put my thing you know I couldn't put my finger on it mm-hmm. but I just thought something awful is going to happen this year I don't know if it's my family or me or my friends something awful is going to happen what, what year was this how many years ago was this, this? was this year this, this was, year yeah that this is when my sort of journey began M- with, moving into t- 2019 yeah you, 2019 yeah so you had this sense of foreboding mm. and you thought hold on a second something doesn't feel quite right absolutely and th- this brought us into the sort of beginning of january in times like that and up, can we just go on the run up to then how was life towards the end of 2018 for you oh it was brilliant um i was doing really well at university um, I've got a seventy-two percent wow. in a in an essay, you, which is a first. That, that is a first. But yeah. before that, even what what was the catalyst then that made you go? Do you know what? I've had all of these different career opportunities, and you thought I'm going to stop doing that, and I'm going to go back to Coventry, and I'm going to study something that I really like, and then hold on a second, that's led me on to media. Mm-hmm. So, so what was the catalyst early on for you to go? Ooh. I'm going to do something different. Well, um, I did 34 years in travel and tourism and um, I decided to go into the police. (laughs) I know, (laughs) as you do. So um, I applied to one police force as a special and got in. Wow. And um, I was just about to start my training and then another police force 
said, would you like to be a PCSO with us? And of course you get paid. Mm. And I was like, yeah, go on then. Yep. So um, I did all my training and um, at the end we had to have our police medical. Oh. And um, bearing in mind I'd lost tons of weight. I learned how to run, which I hated because mm. the bleep test yeah, is not yeah. nice. No, it's not nice, is it? Um, so I went from hating running to actually quite enjoying it to I want to run a marathon I love wow. it you know chariots yeah, of fire yeah. do in, in the back of your mind yeah, yeah. constantly yeah. and so my level of fitness was great lost tons of weight I could run I was super duper fit I passed everything until it came to the police medical and then what happened um the eyesight test um the police optician noticed something was very wrong with the eyes right. i was like well i wasn't aware well actually i was a bit because i knew something wasn't quite up with the eyes it says you've got a problem with distance and you have just gone over what is acceptable oh no but he said the main thing is it says you're telling me you can see double i'm like yeah sometimes and i can see little floaters and he said, well, your trainers have noticed that you get very tired, um, especially when you're doing things like the first stage. You were physically exhausted at the end of trying to give resuscitating yeah, Annie mouth to mouth yeah. and chest compressions. Well, that, in, in fairness, that does take a lot of effort. Oh, in fairness. <laughs> yeah. It was the dummy giving me the yeah. mouth to mouth yeah. and the chest. And um, he said that the trainers are concerned. They don't know if you're exhausted or you've got fatigue issues. But it says, I think we need to get you to the eye hospital okay. straight away. Yeah. So me and the trainer went in the car to the eye hospital. They saw me. And about six to eight weeks later, having had lots of eye tests and oh, having like a big plaster over my eye and wonderful things they were doing. They said, you've actually got ocular myasthenia. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, you're going to have to help me with that, Karen. Yeah, <laughs> it took me a week to pronounce yeah. it properly. Ocular um, myasthenia. Ocular myasthenia. It basically is muscle weakness of right. the eyes. Uh, and that's what was causing the double vision, um, the floaters. And also they thought I might have myasthenia graphis which causes a lot of fatigueness. Right. So it's basically muscle wastage. And um, if you imagine your brain and your body constantly having a domestic yeah. and not getting on yeah. uh, and the, the signals aren't being sent, it's that basically. Wow. And um, yeah, obviously the police career came to yeah, an end and I was devastated. I was going to say, how did you react to the re sort of rejection there? Heartbroken. Oh, crumbs. Uh, because at the same time, another police force got in touch and um, they wanted me to be a special and another police force wanted me to go to, a, as my mum calls it, a proper coppers assessment day. Right. And I was like, what is going on? And I, I was heartbroken because ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to be a Juliet Bravo. Do you remember Juliet Bravo? <laughs> I do Bra remember. I'm Ju sure our listeners uh, yeah. remember Juliet Bravo. <laughs> Juliet Bravo, great. I wanted to be Juliet Bravo or Peggy out of um, Heidi High. Right. I mean, not much difference, police or holiday camps. That's it. <laughs> they sort of blend. <laughs> and, and so basically I, I, I thought, what do I do? And the police said, you're a bright girl. Why don't you go back to university and get a degree and, and maybe go into the police at graduate level yes. in a nice, safe little office job wow. because you'll never be fit to walk the beat. Uh, and that's what I did. I, I turned up on the open day. I had a clue what I wanted to do. I was looking at psychology, but there was a lot of maths involved. I'm not very good at maths. And so somehow the course director, Charlotte Butler, she sold me sociology and she said, with all your experience and your qualifications, and if you've just been through all this police training, you are practicing sociology. Yep. And I got accepted. It wow. was the most easiest thing in my life, Jeff. That's nice. That's And it did it give you a sense of being in the right place and just being happy where you are and centred? It did. Yeah. Because suddenly um, this sort of, moment came on I thought yeah 
I don't know what sociologist does, <laughs> hmm. but yeah, I like that the course was brilliant. I mean, it it sold it to me, and I thought, well, I can go down different avenues. So yeah, my first um, semester at uni, I was a bit lost. Sure. Uh, we got to Christmas. I was like, can I go now? Because I was so used to courses being about eight or 12 weeks. Yeah. Like, can I go now? Can I get my degree? Can I just go? You know, it's like, you've got to do another two and a half years. You what? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> like, whoa. whoa. Tricky. Yeah, very. But but you got there, though, didn't you? You've, you've, you've kept your, your level of enthusiasm and your work ethic correct. Mm-hmm. And you're doing incredibly well now. And Going back to university a little bit later on in life as well mm, is in hard. some ways. It's yeah. hard, but can you take the life experiences that you've had moving in the early earlier parts of your life and you see things in a different way, don't you? Yeah. And um, you don't absolutely. you don't sweat the small stuff. You 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 know, you enjoy the day, which is what it's about. And and you've done that and more power to you. I'm I'm maximum oh, respect. Well thank done you. you. And that takes a lot of courage. It sure does, because I'm the um, the course rep. Oh, so I'm good. like I'm like mummy bear. So they come to me with all their problems, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I done CSEs. Yep. Totally bypassed O levels and A levels, mm-hmm. except with the B techs and MVQs I had. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, I felt a bit lost the first semester because I was like, what's an A level? Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I had to be extra coached into um, doing essays. Yeah. My first essay, I got 45%. Right, okay. It was it was on Karl Marx, who's a very famous sociologist. Right. And um, everybody's heard of Karl Marx, except Karen. <laughs> oh. So there was a lot of research oh. involved. Yeah, and he's like the godfather of sociology. Yeah. And um, in all fairness, it did take me two years to spell sociology correctly. Well done. Well, <laughs> well done, Karen. So <laughs> That's great. I'm so proud. Now, you come to us here. If you've just joined us, by the way, this is Hashtag Life Stories. Uh, Karen Bucknell is a local lady who has changed her journey uh, quite a few times during her uh, relatively... Well, look, it... Uh, is it okay if I say next year is the big five O? You can, of yeah. course. So Karen is coming up to the big five O, and she is just coming into her third year at Coventry University and really, really enjoying herself. She's found her niche. She's uh, been given opportunities and access to areas in the university where she's really enjoying herself. That's true, isn't it, Karen? It is, yeah. And w- <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you've had more than a few knocks along the way. Absolutely, health wise. Health yeah. wise, yeah. and you've you've kept that positivity. Now, at some stage in your life, how long ago was it since you um, suffered with bowel cancer? Yeah, going back to um, New Year's Eve. That was it. That was your. Yeah, because after this sort of, it was almost like a pre- premonition. Yeah, yeah. And I remember that night. I'm waking up New Year's Day thinking, I can't believe I've just dreamt that. And it came true. Uh, And what it was, um, bowel cancer is horrible. Any form of cancer is horrible. Um, And and that's why I'm very keen to promote bowel cancer Mm. awareness. Mm. I'm not going to go very graphic. No, of course. Because obviously it's a lighthearted show. Sure. And I don't want to scare the listeners. (laughs) Yeah. But things started to go wrong in the bowel department big time. And um, in the February, I went and saw my GP who said, oh, you've got piles. I'm like, no, this isn't piles. Mm. Two weeks later, went back. It's now turned to IBS. Mm, Mm. I don't think it's IBS. And then in the March... um, and bearing in mind, my doctors are brilliant. They're really, really good. Uh, the the medical staff, the receptionists, everybody's been so kind and supportive. Really lovely. And my doctor said, something's, something's really not happening and you really need to go and see someone because you shouldn't be suffering like you are. And we're, we're talking a lot of bodily fluids not working properly right got you and stuff yeah <laughs> um so in the march I went to sally hall hospital and um they saw me and um he basically said 
after a very intrusive oh, examination. Yep, okay. okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah, leave it there. Um, he said, I think you've got bowel cancer. Yeah. And I burst out crying. Oh, crumbs. I'm like, what? And then I had to have lots of scans. And then I had to have um, a, a special test where they put camera. Yeah, I understand. Yep. And um, whilst doing that, I looked at the screen and I saw a very ugly looking tumour. Oh, dear. That looked very angry. And then afterwards, the doctor said, oh, that will have to come out. And he said, um, what time is your dad coming to collect you? I said, it's six. He says, I need to speak to you and your dad. Yeah. And then obviously he did. And to cut a long story short, he said, um, basically, you've got stage three bowel cancer. Oh, my goodness. Um, and um, we have to give you radiotherapy and we will have to basically remove it. Um, yeah. When we remove it, you will have no bowel and um, we will have to give you a permanent colostomy bag. Oh, crumbs. So, and then they discovered with all the other tests, because obviously my myasthenia was playing yeah. up. Um, they discovered through the brain scan that I had a benign brain tumor. Oh, Karen. I'm like, whoa, I just got over the ocular mycenae, the mycenae <sighs> graphics, because in 2018 I was in and out of hospital. Right. Uh, problems with breathing because it was such a hot summer. Yeah. Um, as well as the eyesight. So I'm like, how much more? Oh. Come on. So that was April and I was still trying to get all my working for year two and I just started doing some um radio work for Coventry University Radio Phoenix mm, mm. or Phoenix Radio Phoenix Radio <laughs> yeah. I know it um just before we move on I want to explore a little bit more about how you coped if it's okay with you and Absolutely. you can tell me to to move on if you want Karen I want to explore how in your mind you coped with not only stage three bowel cancer and having um, to have the stoma and, and the and the bag and things like that, uh, but how 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 did you get through that mentally with your own mental health? Did it take a dive? Did you have some help, or have you got a really big sort of support network around you that that said, "Look, come on, we can do this." It was really weird because obviously when you come out of the consulting, mm. the consultation room um, and, and you think, did they just say that? And your dad's like ringing mom going, oh, she's got bowel cancer. Then you have to ring your sister. and Yeah. Um, I think for about a week I was totally numb. But around the same time uh, Phoenix Radio was taking off. And right. That took my mind off it a bit. And then I entered... Um, a TV competition <laughs> and that really helped me because I, I think if it wasn't for the radio and the television and, and I started to learn a little bit about journalism yeah. I think I really would have gone into a deep depression sure I would so have you just nosedive you had some distraction and Absolutely. you had something else to take your focus mm -hmm. didn't you and that gave you some enthusiasm back into life and you're here now smiling away and enjoying yourself in a radio studio yeah. um but to get there you've had that almost you know a really terrible hard journey haven't you going through yeah. those health things and yeah. this all stemmed from that feeling of foreboding on on new year's eve new year's day mm. this year yeah because new year's day i woke up and I dreamt I was in this funny machine that had sails and it was going round and round. Oh. And now I now realise it was the radiotherapy machine. Wow. I had to have six weeks of very intensive radiotherapy five times a day. I practically lived at the QE hospital. Good, um, good team over there, aren't oh, they? Oh, they're a brilliant they're team. They're amazing people. The radiologists, the doctors, the yep the nurses, the admin stuff. So that machine I dreamt that I was in, in my really scary dream, was actually the radiotherapy machine. So and all the scary scanners as it, well, because they're pretty, like, horrific. How, how did you ha have that as a dream? I have no idea. It, it, Premonition. That is, oh, that's an so amazing story. I was scared. Story. I woke up thinking, oh, 
What's this scary machine? And, and within three or four months, yeah, you were there. In, in the June, I was in it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, all right, so six months later, <laughs> you were inside the scanner, the, the um, you know, the uh, CT scanner and whatnot, yeah. uh, having some radiotherapy. Yeah, and it was horrible. And uh, after an operation and a, a complete change of your of your lifestyle yeah. my operation actually isn't until october they have to do it in stages Oh crumb. so you um, haven't had the removal i haven't had it yet um i've been briefed on it and yesterday i was at um honestly i'm doing the rounds of hospitals in the west midlands mm-hmm. yesterday i was at good hope hospital right when i'm having my operation mm. and, and thankfully uh, the radiotherapy has worked it's contained the cancer it's reduced the tumours oh. so they can safely operate. Uh, so the, I, I know it's so confusing. I get so confused. Um, the operation now is um, in October. Okay. Uh, they're going to remove the bowel and, and the tumours. And then um, I'm going to have a permanent colostomy bag. Okay. And all being well, the cancer would have been cut away and mm. all gone. Mm. Okay, they're, they're pretty positive. They're, if they're, oh, they're, they're very that, that's positive. Good. Yeah. And of course, we wish you here or, at, oh, at the radio station. You. And um, I'm sure when when we put this out, uh, we'll get some messages of support for you, Karen. Thank you. I think having cancer just knocks your self confidence, and and you're in that sort of wilderness. You know, like Jesus was, was in the wilderness for forty yeah. days and forty nights. You, you're suddenly in this very strange place, and it can be quite a lonely place. And yeah, I mean, my emotions have been up and down, but it's been the radio, the TV work, uni, my journalism that yeah. has kept me going. And even though I'm only like sort of at stage one, I've got a very long journey to climb. It did take my mind off it and it gave me that extra edge of confidence. And bringing that into, uh, you, you just almost mentioned it a, cu- a couple of seconds ago, you have a very strong faith. I do, yes. And uh, has the people around you and your personal faith helped you through um, some of the these down times? Absolutely. I mean, I have always been um, a regular worshipper at church. Right. Even when I was a little girl, I went to a church in Hall Green and I was part of their drama group, so I was mm-hmm. used to being on the stage. Um, and then I went to a church in Acot Screen. I now go to a church in Coventry. It's right. like a little house group church, which is linked to uh, Coventry Cathedral. So my faith really helped me, and my friends and the vicars have really helped me. Even churches that I went to as a teenager or as a young person mm. have got in touch and sent me flowers and well wishes, and that's lovely. I mean, my family and friends... Um, university, the radio company, and um, I actually won a competition and did some work with ITV Central News. They've all been brilliant, mm. so so supportive, and um, very encouraging. Excellent. Yeah. So your faith forms quite a strong part of your day to day life. Yeah. Your the the support network around you is is much wider than just your immediate family, isn't it? Because you're yeah. you're having all these. These di- different people from different churches, even. Mm. And, and growing up, you you mentioned that you you went to a lot of different churches and you saw and you you experienced different things in different places, mm. and and you've you've managed to keep that level of faith and keep that going, haven't you, in the community? I have, yeah. Um, a long time ago, um, I wanted to be a vicar. Oh, and actually move into being part of the church yeah. yourself. Um, I went to West Hill College and did my diploma in pastoral studies. This was in the 90s. Uh, sort of like uh, theology, yeah. sociology, which I never paid much attention to. Uh, women's but, studies, but, African but studies. But have you not noticed now that <laughs> now that you've come back and it's gone a little bit more full circle, yeah. sociology is very you. I think it is actually, yeah. yeah. It's just taken this journey for you to yeah. realise that. I think so. And you've you've come yeah. into you've you've come into it in a different angle, mm-hmm. but it is the way you're made up, isn't it? I think so because um, what happened when I left um, West Hill College? I did two and a half years as a church and community worker, mm. and that was practicing sociology without me go. even knowing without about it. Without you knowing it, it. Yeah. and now you're going back. You're studying. You're reading sociology at Coventry I Uni, am, yeah. and you're you're becoming that person that you should have been two and a half, three, four, five years ago when you were 
when you're actually doing it out there in the community? It was probably more 20 years ago. Oh, just 20 well, years ago. Bless yeah. you. No, it's it, all right. In all fairness, Jeff, it only feels like two, three years ago. Yeah. In reality, it's probably 20, 25 years ago. But it's ago. taken you... Oh, it's taken me this long, That, yeah. that long for mm. that particular life experience to happen, hasn't it? I think so. And my very good friend and the vicar of St. Clair's Church in Coventry, mm. she said to me, she says, God doesn't put you through what... He doesn't think you can cope with. Right. And she says maybe um, he's using you in the nicest possible way so that one day you can tell your story and help people that are going through cancer in a sociological and journalistic way. Sure. So like a baptism of fire, really. It, it, it is. But yeah. more importantly, <laughs> you are the most experienced person to be able to communicate it, aren't you? Because yeah. you've not only gone through that and in uh, you know a month or so's time you're going to have quite a life-changing operation mm -hmm. and a procedure which is going to get rid of your stage three bowel cancer um what if anything are they going to do with the benign tumor oh it's a bit of a sore one this oh, um because they want to take it out oh, and my Christ. motto is if it ain't broke Absolutely. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You're not shaving half my hair off. Yeah. Um, so I've been quite adamant and said, leave it. You know, it's not doing anything. Have you named him? Brian. Brian, <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> Brian the brain tumor Brian is the brain. doing all right. He's all right. He's just sitting in there. And I, I really, I, I said, please just don't mess. It's benign. The minute it goes to a cancerous, then we have to cross that bridge sure. when we come to it. Sure. But honestly, Brian's company for Bert, the bowel <laughs> cancer. Oh, <laughs> right. So hold on. So we've got Bert, the bowel cancer, Brian, the brain tumor. I really admire you, Karen. You've got to call them names, uh, haven't you? It is. So, you, you know. I was half joking that you'd, <laughs> no, you're, you're spot that, on, actually. <laughs> that you'd name like, them. Welcome to my world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not only do so, I name my teddy bears, I name no, my so, tumours oh, as so well. <laughs> Brian the brain tumour is just along for the ride, isn't he? He is. And as the surgeon said, and the cancer nurse, and can I just say that all the cancer nurses at all the hospitals I've been to and Macmillan... Yeah. Uh, cancer nurses have been absolutely brilliant they're just so lovely and they listen to my really stupid questions no that come out there's no stupid questions <laughs> that's what they there? say yeah, that's exactly <laughs> I mean, right I, i'm a woman we, we're going to ask stupid questions um <laughs> and they they listen to all my fears and all my concerns that's amazing and and woman to woman they can reassure me you're going to be okay you're mm. going to be fine don't worry um, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, basically anyone that has a tumour, whether cancerous or benign, it's still scary of if course. it's a benign, mm. it's still there, it's still a part of you, but the surgeon said you could have had it for years, you probably have it for years and nothing will come of it. Mm -hmm. Um, it just means I have to be monitored about every six months okay. um, and wear a helmet and go into a MRI scanner for about mm -hmm. an hour. Uh, it's not pleasant. It's a really no. horrible experience. I bet. But they just said, we'll keep an eye on it. But they're more concerned about the bowel cancer. Sure. Because I've got two tumours. Oh, that, that they're going to get rid of? Yeah, one's in the bowel and one's up the back. Oh, okay, passage, okay. Which is very embarrassing. I can oh, understand. We'll quickly move on. Yeah, we'll quickly move on. <laughs> So Bert's got a friend. <laughs> I haven't named that one. We ought to name him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you happen to know how big Brian is? Yeah, it's a nape of my neck. So it, and they it, said it's not golf ball size or anything like that. It's what, marble? No, it's the size of a walnut. Walnut, it's okay. walnut. I've got a walnut. Growing... <laughs> Uh, or not, not necessarily great. It's, growing. Growing. it's, it's static, just and they they have put me through the uh, MRI scan, scan a few yep. times. It's not moving. It hasn't changed shape. Not moving, right. and it's just there. And like I said, they think I could have had it forever. Sure, it's just by chance got picked up. Wow. And and lucky it did in some ways, isn't it? Because now you can have it monitored and uh, just see what's going on. Yeah, the um, the guy from the neurology department says half the population of Birmingham are probably walking around with a benign brain tumour they know nothing about. Yeah. So he says it's fairly common. We're not that concerned at the moment. 
but do you know obviously if you get headaches or become dizzy or mm -hmm. get faint or you know you really start seeing strange stars and experiencing mm. real big visual problems you know your, your sight really is playing up then obviously just go via a and e and they will see you automatically and, and get you and, back in and the get scanner. on get on yeah. you on the pr right process isn't it yeah now Apart from Brian and Bert and Bert's we, we friend, to, right. and uh, we'll call him Bert's friend at the moment. Oh, um, that's so much fun in ages. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> oh, I have to come out a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've come through this. You've, you've kept your strong faith. You've got a nice support team around you. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move it into where we are now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's not focus on October. Let's focus on a year's time when you finish um at uh, at Cov University mm -hmm. um where are you going to go what what's your next step you know because you've obviously Ooh. sat sat at home and you've thought right what shall I do now where where can I go with my life yeah um I've had a real strange year this time last year um I was on BBC Coventry in Warwickshire talking about having ocular myasthenia, myasthenia graphis, yeah. and being a mature student mm. going into my second year. And I can honestly say, Jeff, hand on heart, when they asked me to go into that radio studio, I was like, oh. So for about a week, I was having like serious panics. Panics. Yeah. Um, Funny turns. Yeah. I was, like, I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to yeah. do it. I don't want to do it. And on the day... Um, I felt really sick. I had butterflies in my stomach. And I walked up to that radio studio in Coventry. It was like I was facing my own execution. Wow. I was like, I was like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Can we get it over and done with? And I was like, really nervous. And they sat me down in the radio studio and I was shaking. I was mm, like bunny gross. in the headlights. Yeah. I hate my, I, I had a real fear of microphones. Um, well, don't look around in this room then. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. There's a green one, yeah. there's a yellow one, there's a red <laughs> one. Ah. Um, it stems back from my Haven mate days. When I was a, a holiday camp entertainer, I would never do any of the comparing because I really hated the microphones. Okay. So I did two seasons never having to compare or use a microphone. That was lucky. And I was very lucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but it came back. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I sat in the studio and the little on-air light went on. And then something really strange happened. It was like a light bulb moment. Suddenly this light came on. I was like, oh! And then I came alive. And then afterwards, the producer and the presenter said, you were brilliant. You were really good. Would you like to come and, and do some more guest appearances? No, I mean, yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then it all started from there. And uh, this is where... You're never too old to have a new career mm. because I had no intention of going into media. I was like, what? And then what happened? Um, I did quite a few guest appearances with um, the local BBC radio station, which was really good, good yeah. experience. And the more I did it, the more confident I became. Like, I quite like this. This is a bit of all right, isn't it? Yeah. And they were so friendly and, and so kind and supportive. And then in February, uh, Phoenix Radio wanted radio presenters and we had to audition. Ooh. And I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, show Willie, just yeah. turn up. And I did it. And my show is called the Kazzy Bazzy Radio Show. It's a very fun packed show. And it features a lot of music like ska, two-tone reggae, punk, mod. You know, music for the lecturers and music for the students, mums and dads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> music that they were growing up with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, a lot of students don't know that Coventry is the home of two-tone music, which is music by the specials, the beat, the selector, madness. And, um, yeah, I auditioned and they offered me my own show. I was like, Are you sure? You got this right? Yeah. Can we just check those names? Yeah, Are absolutely. you having a look? <laughs> it was a bit like that. <laughs> and then the, the first couple of weeks in the studio, the radio producer helped me. And I was like, what does that button do? What does that do? Will that go bang? Yeah. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't press the red button. <laughs> That's it. And, um, and the playlist on the computer. Now, my music is like, 1980s, okay. 1990s. We, we sort of stop at 2000. Mm -hmm. And on the playlist, I was like, is that a boy or a girl singer? Is that a naughty song? Yeah. Or is that a song I can play on the radio? And so we had to go through the playlist because I hadn't got a clue. Sure. 
It's a skill, isn't it? Yeah, we had to play some modern stuff mm. and some old stuff. So it, it is a skill. So I was going home, download, you know, downloading all this music onto Spotify. Ooh. I was like, oh, it's quite good, isn't it? I quite your, like yeah, this yeah. modern music. So now I'm quite an expert. I'm oh, quite, good. yeah, that good. will work. That won't. Well, yeah. that's how you produce a radio show. So you're now a self-producer. I don't know what I am, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds good. So yeah. and you've obviously got a following through Phoenix Radio. I have, yeah. And um, people are sort of logging in and listening to your shows. Is it a weekly show? It is. Um, it's normally on a Wednesday. Okay. Because obviously my timetable's changed this year, it will probably be more, um, more probably three till five. On a Wednesday? On a Wednesday. And you can pick it up on Mixler. Com. Ooh. Ooh. Listen to you doing your own plugs for your own <laughs> radio station. It's only because it took me about two hours to figure out how to get into Mixler. Mixler. Like, yeah. M-I-X-L-R.com. Uh, oh, your spelling's coming on. There I we go. really good. I, I can spell. <laughs> yeah. hey. Mixler.com. And um, you can listen into Phoenix there. Yeah, and your your show will stream live, and uh, and people can listen to um, your ska, two tone reggae. Yeah, mod it's um, choices. It's yeah, and we do things like uh, the cinema review, and I started to go into journalism. Right. So I did my first ever journalistic piece was on um, Coventry Knife Angel, which was outside the cathedral for sure. about two. I remember months. it being out, out there. Yeah, yeah, it was lovely. It was so nice to go past and and pay respects every day, and um, on knife crime, and it was a tough one to do, but mm. I sort of cracked it, and they helped me. So that was where I was at in sort of April when I left my university and had the whole long summer. Mm, yeah, that's a long summer, absolutely isn't it? Absolutely nothing. That wasn't the case because, like I said earlier, I won a competition with Media Trust in partnership with ITV, yep. and they picked me to be the ITV Central News winner. Wow! So now I did it because the audition video was um, interesting, <laughs> um, and I did it, and I did my report on two tone music. Lovely, and I got to interview Neville Staple from the specials mm -hmm. and Neil Davis from the Selector and. Uh, Got to meet the wonderful community of the Two Tone uh, Village, right. and um, now very, very good friends of mine. And I got to do some work experience with Central News, and they put my finished report on their news program. Brilliant! Stuff. And I got to meet all the famous people that are associated with Central News. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? So you became part of that community for a bit. I did. I, I still am. You still are. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm on the inclusion and diversity panel, which is looking at how people from different ethnic backgrounds with disabilities sure. can bring something to TV, mm -hmm. tell their stories, get the local communities involved. And um, I still do story leads and a little bit of research and script writing to pass on to the main um, presenters. That's fantastic. So suddenly so, you've got the media bug. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know where it came from, but you've, yeah. You've been infected with the media bug. Yeah. And you, you're thinking, right, sociology is going to lead me down the path of broadcast journalism. Correct. And <laughs> I am going to look out there, get the story, write the story, report the story... <laughs> and uh, and and move on like that. Yeah, the only thing is, Jeff, I'm torn between radio and TV because in November, you know where I'm going to fall. Yeah. You know which side <laughs> I fall. Um, radio, you can sit there all scruffy and sitty in a big cardigan, and oh, no one can see you. Thank you very much. TV. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff looks really smart, by the way. He looks re he's got a lovely check shirt on. He looks great. A TV, you do have to get really glamorous and really doled up mm. tv they like the hair down radio you can get away with a scruffy bun no one cares <laughs> so there's a big difference um and of course radio is all about sound whereas tv yeah, sure. is all about pictures so i am torn and in november i have to start applying for graduate schemes uh to go into tv or radio or to go and do an ma in media journalism <gasps> I'm torn. I don't know what oh, to do. Oh, you've got so many decisions. What will be, will be. <laughs> you know my 
sway on things. Um, I think radio is the way forwards. Yeah, because I don't have to get dolled up. <laughs> uh, no, it's not that for me. I think radio is much more intimate and much more on demand. And uh, To be honest, yes. You I know, totally being agree. let into somebody's ears is much more intimate and uh, I'm thankful for people that listen to the radio because I think you can paint that picture um, mm, with better. your voice and I think voice is the key. I totally agree because when I was doing my reporting, I loved doing radio reporting because you can listen to the different accents, mm-hmm. different tones and you can really get a lot of people's emotions just through their voice. Agreed. If I'm going to be totally honest, and I think it's the way God wants me to go, I think I'm going to be more inclined to say radio. Oh, well done. Ah. <laughs> Thank you for having good faith in that. <laughs> no, this is good. Um, if you've enjoyed... <laughs> Karen, you're not going to go away from Solihull Radio because oh, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to wait and see where you're, where you, which side you fall with radio and TV. And uh, I'd, I'd really like you to be part of what's going on in terms of the output of our radio station here that locally. That would be amazing. That uh, would be really because great. I think you've got a lot of positivity and a lot to bring to our local community, which is what the station is about here. It is. And can I just thank all the listeners for listening in? And if you've been affected by cancer or your family or your friends then my heart really does go out to mm, you. Mm. It's a little it's a little club. I call it the cancer club. Right. And um it's a it's it's a tough club to belong to because you are on an emotional roller coaster. Not only has it affected me, but it affects my family, my mom, my of dad, course. my sister. Yeah. I've got a new boyfriend. Well, hey. Hi Mark. <laughs> oh, there's Mark. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Mark's been so supportive and I didn't think um, having cancer and, and what's going to happen to me with the uh, colostomy bag. I didn't think I'd ever get a boyfriend ever again, but wow. I have. I'm so happy. Oh, so life uh, is good it, in some ways. You are <laughs> an incredibly positive person. Uh, and I'm hoping that some of that positivity radiates my way. Um, I'll have some of that. Uh, no, you, you're an incredibly positive person. And I just wish you all the best over the next four or five months of what's been going on but you and I are now going to keep in contact we aren't are. we and yeah. I need to get you back into this studio and thank you Jeff for letting me be a part of Solihull Radio and sharing my life story and as I always say this time next year it could be so very very different that, and that's the whole point of that's hashtag life yeah. hashtag life stories isn't it the mm-hmm. journey that we're on um and in your case Karen um having that guiding light of your faith I think has been very important for you. Yeah, I mean, without my faith, I think I would have struggled a lot more. Mm. And, um, you know, one day I want to tell my story. I I do have my own little um, Facebook. um, It's called Karen's Cancer Journey. It's on Facebook. It's just, it's an honest account of what it's like living with cancer. And, um, yeah, my family and friends have really supported me on that and uh, yeah karen's cancer journey so if you want a quick look, uh, look that's brilliant great stuff um thank you so much for listening into hashtag life stories here on solihull radio if you have a life story that you would like to share with that, the rest of our community why don't you get in touch email studio at solihullradio.com and uh, let's get the first contacts and the uh, email trail started so that we can get you into the studio And you, like Karen, can be part of our local story, which I think is incredibly important. Thanks, Karen, for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Have you enjoyed yourself? I have. I haven't been in a radio studio since May, so it's been like, ah. Thank you to everybody that's listened to my life story, and I hope you've got something out of it. So thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.